This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. So I will start by welcoming you and uh, thanking you for coming tonight. I'm really delighted to see all of you here showing this interest in um, our Earth and in sustainable energy, which is the topic of my talk today. So I know that this was billed as a free public talk. Um, but unless you walked here or rode your bike or maybe took Caltrain, I'm sure it cost you uh, more than a few cents to get here. So ever since gasoline prices rose above $4 a gallon, I've been myself very aware of every mile I drive my car. And every 20 miles or so, I think, wow, I just used a, a gallon of gas. Uh, that just cost me $4. But these high gasoline prices uh, that we're experiencing now are really just a small part of what we face as a nation and as inhabitants of, of this planet. So even so, I want to start with a gallon of gasoline. Um, every gallon of gasoline, every bit of gasoline that we burn in our cars. <laughs> Thank you. I thought that was a little too much microphone there. Um, every bit of gasoline that we burn in our cars produces carbon dioxide, which is CO2. And in fact, every gallon of gasoline that we burn generates over 1,000 gallons of carbon dioxide at atmospheric pressure. So CO2 is a light molecule, but even so, that's more than 17 pounds of carbon dioxide for every gallon that we burn of gas. So just doing the math, if you burn 100 gallons of gas, that creates nearly a ton of carbon dioxide, 2,000 pounds. So I'm going to come back to this sort of massive quantity of carbon dioxide um, that we use. So I think all of you would agree that we live in a very energy intensive society. Uh, the main type of energy that we use is electrical energy, which is electricity. And in this country, we're all very accustomed to ready access to electricity. We plug things in, we turn on light switches. We usually don't even think about where the electricity is coming from. And if you ask most kids, and maybe even many adults, where the electricity behind the wall socket is coming from, they may not know. And, and moreover, they may not have even thought about it before. So where does this come from? Uh, even though electricity is a very useful form of energy, there are actually very few direct sources of electricity on Earth. So one example is a lightning storm. But electricity is really a secondary energy source. So you get it by converting a different type of energy into it. And the original source of energy that you convert into electricity can be something like nuclear, or wind, or sun, or hydrodynamic, or chemical energy. So I just uh, was at Niagara Falls earlier this summer, and I'm sure some of you have visited there as well. And when you're standing at Niagara Falls, you get a real physical picture and sense of the sheer energy of the water dropping over those falls. So there are hundreds of thousands of gallons per second of water falling over 1,000-foot drops. Okay, so that's a lot of energy. And in fact, people realized that was a lot of energy a long time ago, and they've been harnessing that hydrodynamic energy and converting it to electrical energy since the 1800s. So today, Niagara Falls produce over four gigawatts of energy. Okay, so four gigawatts of energy may not mean that much to you. And I'm going to try in, in my talk today to kind of calibrate for, for these different energy units that I'm talking about. But let me just say that this four gigawatts of energy from Niagara Falls is enough to power 4,000 jet engines. So you may be thinking, wow, that's, that's a lot of energy. But let me help you get calibrated. The current world energy consumption is 13 terawatts, which is 13 trillion watts. So Niagara Falls was measured in gigawatts, which is just a billion. So the world is using basically 3,000 Niagara Falls worth of energy. The lion's share of that energy, about 85%, is being converted from chemical energy. And that chemical energy is mainly coming from the burning of fossil fuels. That's coal, gasoline, oil. So as I'm sure you're all very well aware, the world has come to rely very heavily on fossil fuels to meet its energy needs. Basically, fossil fuels have acted as the low-hanging fruit of the energy world. And uh, over 3 billion gallons of oil is burned every day worldwide. Okay, so there are problems with this current model going forward. For one thing, we're beginning to run out of these plentiful uh, forms of, of fossil fuels. So there's a debate on how much fossil fuel is left. Uh, whether you believe we have just a, a decade left or, or several centuries left, either way, I think you need to realize that it's a finite resource and it is eventually going to run out. There's actually a more pressing issue, 
which is that our burning, our extensive burning of these fossil fuels is beginning to cause climate change. So I want to talk a little bit about climate change. And I want to do this by explaining the greenhouse effect and global warming. So I know there's some younger folks here in the audience that have probably just studied this effect. So I apologize if I'm repeating it for, for those of you who are experts. But let me, let me explain a little bit about it. OK, so most of the Earth's energy comes from the sun. Uh, the Earth is actually maintaining a particular temperature due to a natural energy balance between the energy of the sun, which strikes the Earth, and the energy which leaves the Earth. So only about half of the solar energy that strikes the Earth's atmosphere continues on to the Earth. The other half is either reflected off the atmosphere or absorbed by the gas molecules that make up our atmosphere. Thought there'd be a lot of clouds out there to point at, but there, there's a lot of molecules up there. So <laughs> the light that um, is absorbed by the Earth and the light that uh, goes, uh, it takes up by the atmosphere is actually coming from different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the solar spectrum. Um, let me remind you of something you've probably all seen, which is light, sunlight going through a prism, which is splitting the light into a rainbow of color. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay, this is all part of the visible spectrum of light, but there's a lot of light out there that we don't see. So some of the light is from the higher energy side of the spectrum beyond the violet color of the rainbow, and that's called ultraviolet light. And there's also another section of light, part of light, that's lower energy than the red, which is called infrared light. Okay, so most of the ultraviolet light that's coming from the sun is absorbed by our atmosphere, mainly the oxygen and ozone, which is yet another story um, in the atmosphere. And most of the light that actually reaches Earth is in the visible and infrared parts of the spectrum. And this radiation warms the Earth. So here we have this globe, the Earth, um, which is actually relatively warm. It's maybe 50 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit sitting in a space which is much, much colder. So outer space is at minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit. So what happens is Earth radiates its energy back outward. And in fact, Earth is radiating the energy out about twice as fast as the sunlight's being absorbed. So if this kept up for a long time, the Earth would eventually get very cold. This is where the greenhouse effect comes in. The energy that's radiating outward from the Earth is in the infrared region of the spectrum. And most of the gases in our atmosphere absorb this infrared light, some, some better than others. So when these gas molecules that are out there absorb the light, what's happening to the molecules is they're becoming excited and they start vibrating. So eventually, these molecules that are vibrating relax back down. And they do that by radiating the light back out. So half of that light goes outward, but half of it comes back to the Earth, uh, warming it. Okay, so the return of this energy uh, radiated that goes outward, is absorbed by the light, and comes back is called the greenhouse effect. And because of it, Earth is actually 40 or 50 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it would be otherwise. So what are all these gases in the atmosphere? There are lots of gases there. Um, the atmosphere naturally includes things like nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, water, ozone, methane, and carbon dioxide. So not all of those are uh, absorb the light, the infrared light, but water, ozone, methane, and carbon dioxide do. So these are all called greenhouse gases because these are the ones that can absorb the infrared light and radiate it back to Earth. So even though these gases exist in the atmosphere naturally, any small change in their concentration can affect this delicate balance of the greenhouse effect. And this is not something that people realize recently. It's been known for a very long time. And in fact, back in 1900, a very important chemist named Svante Arrhenius carried out a calculation that showed that if the carbon dioxide concentration doubled in the atmosphere, the average temperature of Earth would rise 9 or 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is the effect that you've all heard of called global warming. So that was done a long time ago. And there were, it turned out there were some errors in the calculation. But more recent models have confirmed that this effect is real. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, which shared the Nobel Prize in 2007 with Al Gore, some of you may remember that, has also published reports on global warming showing that for every doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere, the temperature of Earth will rise a few degrees. So unfortunately, this takes us back to my first story about all burning a, a gallon of gasoline and how much carbon dioxide it makes. All of these fossil fuels that we're burning are 
leading directly to carbon dioxide. And most of this is just being poured into the atmosphere. <coughs> so it's adding to the existing CO2 levels. Um, and the CO2 levels in the atmosphere have already risen over 25% in the past century. And the rate of increase in the past few years is even more alarming, showing that our prolonged and increasing burning of fossil fuels is rapidly increasing carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So this effect of warming due to this carbon dioxide is already being observed. There are higher air temperatures, the receding of glaciers has been well documented, increase in wildfires, rising sea levels, all these things we've sort of been reading about increasingly. So what I want to really spend my time talking about though are solutions. Okay. So it's becoming increasingly evident that in order to ward off significant climate change, we're going to need to make changes in how we get our energy. So there has been a huge increase in the interest in sustainable or renewable or clean sources of energy in the last few years. So you can read, especially in this area, you read about new companies, new research, new funding, unfortunately not enough new funding, related to energy every day in the news. So there are all kinds of ideas, some more ambitious or crazier than others that are being pursued. So I'll just mention a few of them. I, I don't have time to go into a lot of these in detail. Of course, there's wind, a lot of you have seen a wind energy being um, captured in California. There are solar cells, which I'm going to leave for later, I'm going to talk about. There's something called solar thermal. There are biofuels. We read a lot about biofuels. Uh, there's energy from the ocean. People are looking at ways of capturing energy in the form of waves and tides. There's geothermal energy. Uh, and there's a, a sort of budding area also called clean fuels. So I just want to mention something about biofuels, because I saw a very funny headline um, just a, a few days ago in the news, which said, lab makes renewable diesel fuel from E. coli poop. <laughs> so some of you may have seen that same, same headline. So there are all kinds of ideas of, about biofuels. Some of them are more mundane and some of them are more exotic. So there, in the US, there's been a lot of emphasis on using corn to produce ethanol. Most scientists actually think this is a very bad idea because it's likely carbon positive, which means it actually generates more carbon dioxide than it's conserving. Plus, it has the other disadvantage of using farmland for energy instead of food. But there are all kinds of other ideas out there. People are trying to use yeast, one of the simplest organisms known to produce oil from sugar. Um, other people are looking at genetically engineering bacteria to convert cellulose to ethanol. And still other people are looking at using algae that's living off of waste from uh, from power plants and converting the, the algae to biodiesel. Okay, so there are all kinds of ideas out there. I do want to point out that in general, plant-based biofuels are very inefficient. So for example, you might hear a lot about switchgrass. That's another material that people are interested in for biofuels. That's only about one hundredth as efficient as the best solar cell. So the other of those topics I want to just mention for a moment, because I'm going to come back to this, are clean fuels. So I want to get back to this carbon dioxide production. So every 100 gallons of gasoline, as I mentioned, that we're burning makes nearly a ton of carbon dioxide. So one of the areas being pursued is the development of fuels that don't produce as much carbon dioxide. So there's a gold standard of this clean fuel area, which is basically hydrogen, H2. So when hydrogen is burned, it basically produces no carbon dioxide. The only product of that is water. Okay, so one of the ways of extracting this chemical energy of, of burning hydrogen is to react it in a fuel cell. And that's another topic that I want to touch upon um, today in my talk. So I can't cover all of these different uh, energy sources. There are some fantastic books out there. Uh, for a nice discussion, I'm going to recommend a book written by the president of the Environmental Defense Fund, which is called Earth the Sequel. And I'm not getting paid by the author <laughs> to say this. So it's actually required reading in a course that I'm co-teaching next month on sustainable energy technologies to sophomores here at Stanford. So some of the information that I'm going to talk about and have talked about is, for, is gathered from that book. But I, I want to make the point that there's probably not going to be one winning solution. And if we're going to be successful in meeting the world's energy needs in a sustainable way, we're likely going to need a combination of different approaches. So really, they should all be um, given a chance to be pursued. So I want to talk about solar cells first. Um, in my opinion and the opinion of many scientists, it's one of the most promising approaches. And that is directly harnessing the energy of the sun to produce electricity. 
So it's been pointed out by Professor Nate Lewis, who's a chemistry professor at Caltech, that the Earth is bombarded with 100,000 tri trillion watts, which is 100,000 terawatts of solar energy, which is basically 8,000 times the world's consumption. So in other words, I'll quote, every hour the sun provides the earth with as much energy as all of human civilization uses in an entire year. And so if we can harness just a small fraction of this, we could satisfy all of the world's energy needs. So the way that solar energy is converted directly into electrical energy is through a photovoltaic device. That's just another name for a solar cell. So let's just focus on the United States for a moment. If we use solar cells that aren't anything special, so maybe they're 10% efficient, and I'm gonna come back to the efficiency later. If you put solar cells, install them on land 100 miles by 100 miles square, you could produce enough electricity to power the entire United States. So you can just take a chunk of a state, your least favorite state, it has to be sunny, plant the solar cells there and, and power, power the US. And since we're California-centric, most of us, let's just talk about California, if we install photovoltaic devices over 30 miles by 30 miles square, we could produce enough for California's needs. So, and, and another way to think about this is let's compare solar energy to some of the other forms that I've just talked about. So a solar plant requires one-sixth the acreage per watt produced than does wind, and one-thirtieth the acreage per watt compared to biofuels. So it, it can be a very efficient way of, of harnessing this energy. So you might be sitting there wondering, well, if solar energy is so great, why haven't we solved this energy problem already? People have had solar cells for, for a long time. So solar energy is clean, it's renewable, it's sustainable. But there are some problems with solar cells and solar energy that have still not been solved on a large scale. So the first problem with solar energy is intermittency. So what that means is, no matter how sunny your part of the world is, the sun doesn't shine there 24 hours a day. And some days aren't even sunny um, at all. Wind, of course, faces the same kind of problem. So if you're going to use electricity from solar energy in the way we've been accustomed, become accustomed to using electricity, which is basically electricity on demand, uh, we need to be able to store that energy for later use. That's one way of solving it. Or we need some system by which we can coordinate all of these various intermittent sources to produce a steady supply of electricity. So wind, solar, whatever's coming in at a given time. So both of these are really major challenges. Um, and people are pursu pursuing both of these things. Um, finding good ways to store a large amount of electricity, because remember we're looking at large scale solutions, is a very active area of research and one you may hear a lot about is batteries. Um, but there are other things more um, straightforward that people are looking at, I mean, basically heating water, saving the energy in the water, or pumping up water, making your own little Niagara Falls while you have sunlight, and then later letting it fall back down and using that energy. Okay. So there's a second problem, though, which is cost. Okay, so the electricity produced from solar cells is still far too expensive to compete with other options at scale. So electricity produced from coal, which is the cheapest form of electricity, is currently one to four cents per kilowatt hour. Electricity produced from solar cells costs between 17 and 22 cents per kilowatt hour in 2008. So of course this number is a function of where you live. That number is going to be cheaper for sunnier places and more expensive for less sunny places. But the cost, no matter where you live, needs to come way down. So, for comparison, energy from another renewable source, which is wind, is currently five to seven cents per kilowatt hour, but it still has that storage problem. So really, there are two ways to fix the problem with solar cells, this cost problem. We can either make the cells cheaper, or we can make them more efficient, or if we're really lucky, you know, we could do both of those things. So let me just mention what I mean by efficiency. Efficiency for a photovoltaic refers to how much of the energy in the sunlight is converted to electricity. So there's a theoretical limit for what we call a single junction, sort of a single solar cell, which is 31%. This is called the shockley quiser limit. So I want to point out that 31% still means that this is the best we can do. Even at this, we're wasting two-thirds of the energy, okay, 31%. However, most cells don't get anywhere close to 31%. So the world record solar cell, I, I want to point out, is, is for a much more complicated solar cell called a multiple junction cell, and that's 42%. So that's the world record efficiency for converting the energy from the sun into electrical energy. So I wanna talk about solar cells and, and 
maybe how to make them cheaper and more efficient. But first, I want to go over the basics of how they work. Okay, so bear with me while I talk about this. Photovoltaics are made out of semiconductors. So Tom mentioned I worked in the semiconductor field for a long time, so it's kind of a natural transition to look at solar cells because they're made of the same kinds of materials. And you'll see there's a real close connection between them in a moment. So what are semiconductors? You, I'm sure you've all heard of them, but they're solid materials with special electrical properties. So they're basically intermediate between a metal, which conducts electricity very well, and an insulator, which doesn't conduct electricity well at all. So a semiconductor is typically not very good at conducting electricity unless you help it along. So in a normal, relaxed state, a semiconductor is not good at conducting electricity because the particles inside it that are the things that move the electricity are not free to move around. They're basically stuck. Okay, so what are those little particles? They are electrons. Okay, so this is what carries the charge in a metal. Um, many of you, of course, know what electrons are. But for those who don't, uh, who didn't take as many chemistry classes as they should have, electrons are one of the main subatomic particles that make up an atom. So electrons have a negative charge on them. So if you look at a solid, it's made up of lots of atoms, has a lot of uh, electrons in it. And in a metal, a lot of those electrons are hanging out close to the nucleus of each atom, but some of them are free to move around. And it's those freely moving electrons which carry the charge in a metal. So things are different in a semiconductor. In a pure semiconductor, unless you heat it up, those electrons are held really closely to the nuclei, really tightly, and they don't move. They can't move. The reason for that is a semiconductor has something called a band gap, which is a barrier in energy that the electrons need to overcome to break free from the nuclei. So one way to think of this band gap is as a river. Because so you have a river, and you have river banks on either side. And on one side, you have a whole bunch of stones. And in order to get to the other side of the river where they can move around freely, they have to somehow get across the river. So you could stand on one side of the river and throw the rocks over. Um, but the wider the river, the harder you're going to need to throw the rocks to get them across. So normally in a semiconductor, this river, which is this barrier, is way too wide, so the electrons can't overcome them. So as a result, there aren't many charge carriers, the ones on the other side of the river, to carry current. One way you can help those electrons overcome this band gap is to heat it. Then the electrons will get excited enough, they'll jump over, and they'll break free. So this is the analog of standing there and throwing the rocks over. So you can take a semiconductor at very high temperature and actually conduct electricity very well because of this. Now, there's another way to get those electrons over the band gap, and this is the important way for solar cells, which is to shine light on it. Okay, so when light hits the solid semiconductor, if the light is of enough energy, it's going to excite the electrons right over the band gap. And once they've hopped the river, so to speak, they become mobile charge carriers. They can move around like in a metal and carry charge. But there, there's actually more to this, which is that when an electron crosses the band gap, it leaves behind something we call a hole. Now, the electron is negatively charged. So when it leaves, that hole that it leaves behind is positively charged. And those holes, because they're charged, they can carry current too. So actually, in a semiconductor, there are two types of charge carriers that you can use to carry charge that are created when light hits it. They're electrons and they're holes, and they both carry charge, and they both lead to electrical current. Okay, there's always a problem lurking in the background, though, when you shine light on a semiconductor, which is that you've, you've excited the electron across the river. It's over there free. The hole's free on the other side. But they might find each other and recombine. When that happens, they cancel out both of the charge carriers. So it's basically like the electron falling back down through the band gap and landing in the hole. So in a photovoltaic device, the way this is prevented is to put two types of semiconductors together. One semiconductor favors holes, and the other one favors electrons. So when you form this electron and hole pair by shining light on it, the electrons separate out into the electron-loving semiconductor and the holes into the hole-loving semiconductor. And they can go their merry way until they're collected in a circuit and generate electricity. Okay, So that was the explanation of how a solar cell works. And I want to go with you through this. Now, using this background information, put together some principles for how you would build a photovoltaic device that worked really well. So number one, your semiconductor should absorb as much of the solar radiation reaching its surface as possible. It's kind of an obvious thing. But the part of the spectrum 
remember there's a whole spectrum of light coming in that doesn't have enough energy to throw that electron over the river is going to pass right through it. It's not going to be absorbed by the semiconductor. It's going to be wasted. So you want to make your band gap small enough so that a lot of that light is absorbed. But there's another constraint, which is number two. You want the device to convert as much of the energy as possible into the charge carriers. Okay, so due to the physics of the system, even if a particle of light or light is absorbed with energy greater than that band gap, you still only get one electron hole pair. So all that extra energy, let's say you threw it way over the river and it went very far away, you still, it's going to sort of find its way back to the river bank. So it's just lost energy, that excess energy. So you actually don't want your band gap to be too low because then you're losing a lot of that energy. So you actually have to choose a band gap that's very closely matched to the solar spectrum. And that's what most modern solar cells do. OK, so the third consideration is that you want to get as much of the charge carriers as possible into your circuit where you can use them for electrical energy. But the problem is lots of traps lurk along the path that those electrons and holes take. And these traps can capture those, and then they're no longer used for the current. So there are two possible ways to avoid these traps. One is you can use a really, really high quality semiconductor that just doesn't contain a lot of them. So it's very pristine, very nice material that doesn't have a lot of traps. Or the other way to do it is just to design your solar cells so that those carriers don't have to go very far. So even though the material may have a lot of traps, the odds are that they're not going to find one. So where do things stand today with solar cells? By far the most common semiconductor uh, used today in solar installations worldwide is silicon. So in 2007, silicon was 90% of the solar cell market. So since we're sitting right here in the middle of Silicon Valley, it's probably not coming as a big surprise to most of you to hear this. So there's a $200 billion microelectronics industry built up around the use of silicon. So it's only natural that this infrastructure is going to provide a nice platform for using silicon and solar cells. We already know how to work with silicon. It's an excellent semiconductor for a lot of reasons. In fact, silicon it was used in solar cells uh, made as early as the 1950s. And they were actually developed at Bell Laboratories, which is the same place that the transistor was invented. Okay, so given their long history in the use of solar cells, silicon is termed a first generation solar cell technology. So that's a term you may, you may hear, first generation. Despite the fact that it's used in 90% of uh, solar cells installed, it turns out that silicon is actually not that great at absorbing sunlight as semiconductors go. And it does that because it, this band gap is configured in such a way that it doesn't absorb the light well. It, for those of you who study this, it's because it has an indirect band gap. So it doesn't absorb light well. So what's the workaround? The workaround in making silicon solar cells has been to make the silicon thick enough that it absorbs a lot of the light. So I want to point out that this is thick in a relative sense. Okay, typically, the silicon and silicon solar cells are a couple hundred microns thick, which is a couple tenths of a milli millimeter. It's like the, the thickness of a human hair. Okay, so to somebody working in microelectronics and silicon, that's, that's thick. So using these thicknesses and all kinds of modern engineering, uh, people can make solar cells made out of silicon that have efficiencies in the order of 12 to 19 percent. Now, that's, that's pretty good. The downside is that they're expensive. So the purity of silicon that needs to be used in, in these solar cells, it has to be 99.999999 percent pure. That costs a lot to, to get silicon that pure. And the interesting thing is it's also now competing with the semiconductor industry for supply of the sort of raw starting material, which is called polysilicon. So in 2000, the solar industry made up less than 10% of the polysilicon market. And by this year, it's already consuming 50% of the market. So people are actually finding shortages of silicon, ironically, because I'm going to talk uh, in a little bit about the abundance of, of silicon. But there's a shortage of the pure high quality silicon that's needed. OK, so the problem with the silicon solar cells is they're expensive. Well, along came what are called second generation solar cells. Okay, so second generation solar cells refer to what are called thin film solar cells. Thin film solar cells are made from semiconductors which absorb light a lot better. They have what's called a direct band gap. They absorb light a lot better than silicon. So as a result, they can absorb a lot of sunlight without having to be that thick. So typically, 
the second generation thin film solar cells have the semiconductor only about one micron in thickness, which is about one hundredth thickness of a human hair. So it's a very, very thin film. And it, you can lay it down on some really cheap substrate. So people can lay down that really thin, one micron thick uh, material, semiconductor material, on something like glass or flexible strips of, of stainless steel. So you can probably predict that there might be some advantages to this approach. First, in principle, you might be able to make them more cheaply. And second, it might be an advantage to have your solar cells on some flexible material instead of a stiff piece of silicon. So for example, there are companies that are looking at integrating photovoltaics into roofing shingles. If you've followed some of the press releases of some of the newer solar cell companies, and there are quite a few of those around here, a lot of startups, you may have actually heard of some of the materials that are being used, some of the semiconductors that are being used in these second generation solar cells. These include things like copper, indium, gallium diselenide. I know that's a mouthful. It, it's, by shorthand, people refer to it as SIGS, C-I-G-S. And another one is cadmium telluride. Other types of second generation solar cells are organic materials, such as dye sensitized solar cells. And these second generation solar cells have generated a lot of excitement. So this brings me to some of the research being carried out at Stanford. Much of it centers on the category of second generation solar cells. I could have picked many, many different things to tell you about, but I'm, I'm going to focus on, on one project that my research group has been working on in collaboration with several other groups at Stanford. So one thing that I, I want to make clear is these are big problems to tackle, coming up with more efficient, cheaper solar cells or you know, clean fuels or all of these. So uh, a lot of people are working in teams to try to solve these problems. So my group has been collaborating with uh, Professor Bruce Clemens and Mike McGee in the Materials Science and Engineering Department, and Professor Jim Harris in the Electrical Engineering Department on developing thin film solar cells that are made from earth abundant, inexpensive, non toxic materials. So, earth abundant and inexpensive. So why, why do we care about that? The emphasis on earth abundant, non toxic materials is important because if we are going to come up with a solution uh, for producing a large fraction of the world's energy needs, we want to make sure what we're using isn't going to cause a problem. We're going to be using a lot of material. And we should be sure that we're not making our cells out of some niche element that's in short supply, or one that would cause an environmental disaster if we had to mine it, or one that has a very high toxicity. Okay. So silicon, our first generation solar cell material, is extremely abundant on Earth. In fact, it's the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust. But many of the newer solar cell materials for second generation technology, unfortunately cannot make that claim. Look for example at cadmium telluride. There is a lot of concern about the environmental effects of cadmium. It's highly regulated. In fact, it's being banned in the European Union. So what are you going to do if you're making all your solar cells out of cadmium telluride? And then these SIG cells, copper, indium, gallium, diselenide, use indium, which is an element that's really not very abundant. So Actually, both indium and cadmium are about 10 million times less abundant than silicon in the Earth. So what's the downside to that? The downside is given supply and demand, those elements become very expensive. So for example, indium currently costs over $350 a pound just for the raw material. We're trying to make these solar cells cheaply. That, that causes problems. So to get around this problem, this, our groups at Stanford are investigating material that behaves somewhat like this SIGS material, but only uses abundant, inexpensive elements. And the elements that we're looking at are copper, zinc, tin, and sulfur. These are very common elements. So think of tin cans, copper wire, galvanized steel, which uses zinc, and that rotten egg smell. And when you get near a hot spring or a volcano, that's sulfur coming from the sulfur. So the most expensive of those four elements is actually tin, which currently costs $7 a pound. Compare that to the $350 a pound of indium. So the material we're looking at is called copper zinc tin sulfide, which that's also a mouthful. So we had to have an abbreviation too, which is CZTS. Okay, so CZTS is a semiconductor, and it also absorbs sunlight very well. And we believe we can make it cheaply. So actually, that's been one of our major research efforts over the last a uh, couple of years, how to deposit this potentially very interesting semiconductor for solar cells in a, in a cheap way. So the trick is to get all of those elements together in the right proportions and with the right crystal structure. So what I mean by crystal structure is the atoms need to bond to each other in just the right way in the solid. So an example of this is diamond. Okay, think of diamond. 
Diamond is made up of only one element, which is carbon. So when carbon bonds in this crystal structure called diamond, it's of course very valuable. But carbon can also form other solids, for example, graphite. And graphite is the so-called lead in pencils. It's another crystal structure of carbon, way less expensive. So think about how cheaply you can buy pencil lead and how much more that would cost if the pencils were filled instead with diamonds. Okay, so the structure really matters, the crystal structure. So about two years ago, when we decided to start studying this CZTS material, a very uh, talented postdoctoral fellow in my group named Jeffrey King thought, gave some thought to the best way to deposit it. And he decided to try to grow it from solution. Okay, so he was going to make a solution, a mixture, containing different salts of copper, tin, and zinc. And this was unlike anything that had been tried before and very different from anything actually we'd been doing in my research group before. But he thought this could be an easy and inexpensive way of making the material. So the idea is that if he puts all those salts together uh, in a concentration in a solution that's too high, they're going to come out of the solution and form a film. So to understand this, I want you to think about raw candy. Um, I'm sure some of you here have made that. Maybe you've had better luck with it than I ever did. But. Um, so the way you make raw candy is you dissolve sugar, a lot of sugar in water, and then you wait, you have to be very patient with raw candy, until the water evaporates. And when it evaporates enough, the solution becomes more and more concentrated in the sugar until finally it comes out of the, the solution to form these sugar crystals. This is what we call the raw candy. And you might also remember that typically what you do is you dangle in this sugar water a string uh, so that when the sugar crystals form, they form nicely on the string. You pull it out, you can, you can chew on it. So for the case of CZTS, what Jeff does is he puts a piece of glass instead of string in the solution so that when these CZTS crystals form, they form a nice film on the glass. So this material admittedly is a little more complicated than sugar and sugar crystals. So unless he takes special care, he's not going to get the semiconductor forming nicely on the, the glass. He's going to get lots of little pieces inside. So he has to add some other chemicals to make sure the crystal grows well on the glass. And uh, that's actually uh, taken a lot of uh, time and, and effort. And so, so far, he's been able to get very nice crystals of CZTS and use them to make our very first solar cells. So in addition to Jeff, there are these two uh, fantastic undergraduate students that have been working in my lab also on, on different ways of making crystals of CZTS. These are Ben Tran and Christine Pangan Okimoto. I just saw Christine here. Ben's off doing an internship at Merck this summer, but they're both about to be seniors in chemical engineering, as Tom pointed out, one of the best uh, fields of study. Um, so what Ben started trying to do uh, last year is he wanted to try to take very small particles, they're so small they're called nanoparticles because they're about a nanometer in size, of the different components, copper, zinc, and tin, and place them on a glass slide, fuse them together, add some sulfur, and get the crystals that way. Okay, so it turned out that to do this by starting with all those individual components, they had to get the conditions, he and Christine, just right, and it turned out to be a lot of work, like most scientific study, but this was really a lot of work. So I was thinking about this, and for those of you who cook, it's, it's very similar to the temptation I've always had, which is, let, let's think about making a cake. Okay, usually you have to have a lot of different bowls for that. First you cream the sugar and the butter in one bowl, and you sift the flour and the baking so in another, you may have to have another bowl to, to scramble the eggs, and then you mix it all together in one bowl. And if you're anything like me, you've been doing that and just looked and thought, why can't I just mix them all together in one bowl? Why do I have to have all these separate different bowls? Okay, well, this is what Ben and Christine thought about with the CZTS problem. So instead of this long process of three separate solutions of nanoparticles mixing them together, they said, let's just pour it all together in one bowl, which in a chemistry lab, in a chemical engineering lab, is a beaker. Uh, and they found that they can actually make nanoparticles of CZTS this way. And now what they're trying to do is coat them on a glass slide, fuse them together, and try to study them as solar cells. Okay, there's yet another approach that we're taking here at Stanford. Um, and that's by a student in Bruce Clemens' group named Varden Chala, who I also see sitting back there. He's trying a very different approach. So what he's doing is he's growing the material from a gas instead of a liquid. So we've been doing ours in, in liquid. He's trying to do this in the gas. And he uses a process which is called sputter deposition. It's used in a lot of applications. And even though it's done with a gas in, in a big vacuum chamber made out of stainless steel, you can actually do it very cheaply. So for example, sputter deposition is used to coat window glass. And 
Uh, it's even used to make the metal foil liners and potato chip bags. So clearly, you can use sputter deposition for cheap processing. So it turns out that sputter deposition had actually been used to deposit this semiconductor, CZTS, by the Katagiri group in Japan, which is a group that's really pioneered this solar cell material. And they've been able to make solar cells out of CZTS that have efficiencies of more than 6%. Okay, that's a lot lower than the 19 to 20% I was talking about with silicon, but not bad for this early in development. Silicon's been studied for decades. So Varden is doing sputter deposition with a twist. Okay, so in the usual method, what you do is you first put down the copper, the zinc, and the tin, and then later you expose it to the sulfur to get the S in CZTS. So the problem is that requires a pretty extreme treatment to get the sulfur in there and to get it to form this nice crystal. So what Varden is doing is he's adding the sulfur directly while he's sputtering so that right from the start he gets complete CZTS and he's finding that he can make very high quality films this way. So the group of us here at Stanford are encouraged by uh, these different ways of making CZTS and we're just at the point of starting to make and test our first solar cells with these materials. So we're finding that they do act as semiconductors, they absorb light, and we can produce electrical current when we make them in a cell. So one thing I want to point out, though, is that no matter how good our material is and how good we can make it, we are always going to be limited by the Shockley-Quiser limit, Shockley -Quiser limit of 31%. So I know those of my students and the other students in the audience would be thrilled with anything close to 31% for ourselves. But, um, it, it would be fantastic to be able to get good efficiencies using such a cheap, abundant, non-toxic material. But there are other people, and I just want to leave you with kind of this thought on the solar cells around the world who are looking at ways of beating that 31%. Okay, so these are called third generation solar cells. Okay, so third generation solar cells are, uh, use all kinds of different um, methods and tricks. Some of them are more outlandish than others. Uh, but basically, they come down to either using more of the light or wasting less of the energy. So without going into detail, I want you to be aware that there are these third generation cells that are of interest. Okay, so now what I want to do is a small demonstration, and I'm hoping that my demonstration will work. So let me pull this out. Okay, so what I have is a car with a solar cell. Okay, so this is a little actually silicon solar cell, 90% of the market. Uh, and this solar cell converts sunlight into electrical energy and runs the car. But unfortunately, there's not nearly enough sunlight to get this car to move at all. So fortunately, this is a special car which was designed to take that into account. Okay, so it has a setup to take the electrical energy produced from this photovoltaic to split water over here into its components, hydrogen, and oxygen. So it does that by carrying out a, a reaction in something called an electrolyzer. Okay, so it takes electricity and converts water to hydrogen and oxygen. And I did that earlier when it was daylight. I actually used a lamp. But, um, so I've done this ahead of time. And why would I want to do that? It's because I now have stored the hydrogen in here and I'm going to use it as my fuel to power the car. Okay, so this fuel this hydrogen is going to react with oxygen to produce water and also energy. And it's going to do this by going through a fuel cell. So let me try to assemble this thing. So I've got to connect it up and hope for the best. So. Oh, yeah. OK. I'm going, to, I'm going to move it over here so you can let it drive. OK, so it's actually operating the fuel cell right now, which is combining the hydrogen and oxygen together, directly making electrical energy, which is driving the mechanical motors of the car. It's a very nice demo of which I, uh, for which I have to thank Tom Jaramillo, my colleague who let me borrow that. That's his toy. Okay. So, uh, the key point that I wanted to get across is that in addition to the solution I've just spent quite a bit of time talking about, which is solar cells or wind turbines or things like that, we really need a way to store energy and to move it around with us. Okay, we need portability for lots of applications. 
like a car. And we also need to have energy on demand so we can use it even in the dark. If we didn't have the energy stored in the form of hydrogen here, I wouldn't have been able to drive the car. And that's why fuels are so desirable and we rely on them so heavily. They're transportable and they're storable and they're a good form of energy. Okay, so one way to store energy, which I've already just mentioned, is hydrogen. Okay, so remember that hydrogen is considered the cleanest of the clean fuels because when you burn it, it only produces water, no carbon dioxide. So we could just put hydrogen and oxygen together in a reactor and effectively burn the hydrogen to get the energy out. But there's a more efficient way of doing this, and that is using a fuel cell like what was operating this car. So what a fuel cell does is directly convert chemical energy into electrical energy. And the chemical energy is coming from the reaction of H2 plus O2 coming together to form water. The way a fuel cell works is it, in a way it's able to harness the energy directly into electrical energy is it only lets the oxygen contact the hydrogen in a very controlled fashion. It does this uh, through something which is called a membrane. So in one type of fuel cell, which is called a solid oxide fuel cell, there's a membrane that separates the oxygen and the hydrogen, and it only lets the oxygen come across through the membrane to the hydrogen side after it's first split apart. So oxygen has two O atoms in it. It splits apart to oxygen atoms, and it gets an extra electron or two on it. So with these extra electrons on the oxygen atom, then it can go through this membrane, get to the hydrogen, and react. So when this oxygen is moving, it's got this extra electron, it's negatively charged. That's part of a circuit, right? It's carrying the charge. So it becomes part of the electrical circuit. Once the oxygen comes across the membrane, gets to the other side, reacts to form water, it actually releases some of the electrons. And to get back to the other side, they go through the rest of the circuit, completing it. And this is how we pull electrical energy out. So to picture a fuel cell, Imagine that it's constructed like a sandwich. They, they actually are very much like sandwich structures. So I must have been hungry when I was thinking of this analogy. I want you to think of pastrami on rye. Okay, so two pieces of bread with pastrami in between. So the pastrami is the membrane and the two pieces of bread, rye bread, are the electrodes. So a typical solid oxide fuel cell sandwich has a relatively thick membrane. Uh, sort of like a New York style sandwich where they pile the pastrami really, really high. And uh, you don't need to go to New York to get that. You could just go to Max's Opera Cafe right down the street at Stanford Shop Shopping Center and get one of these really, really thick pastrami sandwiches. So this is what I want you to think about for the solid oxide fuel cell. So this kind of fuel cell is very attractive as an energy conversion device because they're very quiet, they're stable, they're efficient, they're mechanically strong. But there's a really big downside currently to this type of fuel cell, which is that they have to be operated at very high temperatures, currently about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, in order to work well. So one of the main reasons that they have to operate at such a high temperature is it's really hard to get the oxygen through that much pastrami. Okay? Uh, so the motion of the oxygen is helped along by heating it to these really high temperatures. But who wants to have a fuel cell sitting in their car operating at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit? So one of my colleagues here at Stanford, Professor Fritz Prince of the Mechanical Engineering Department, has been investigating for a number of years a solution to this problem. And his group has been able to reduce the operating temperature of solid oxide fuel cells significantly by thinning that membrane. So this way, the oxygen can pass through much more easily. So think about it as a healthy version of the pastrami sandwich with just a single, measly, thin slice of pastrami there. So the Prince group does this by making the membrane as thin as 100 nanometers across, which is 100 thousandth of an inch, very thin. So the oxygen doesn't have as far to go, and they can operate their fuel cells at much lower temperatures, about six to 700 degrees Fahrenheit. But there's a new problem that crops up when they do this, which is that when they run the fuel cells at those low temperatures, it's actually hard to get that oxygen to break apart into those atoms with the charge on it. So that takes place at the electrode, which is one of the slices of rye bread. So to help the reaction along, in a fuel cell, we add something called a catalyst. A catalyst helps the oxygen break apart. And going with the food theme here, you can think of it as a thin coating of mustard on each slice of bread. I'm going to come back to the mustard. Okay, so my group has been collaborating with Professor Prince's group for several years on ways of putting down this catalyst. So we're using a metal called platinum. Sure. 
a number of you out here are probably wearing jewelry made from platinum. Uh, in addition to making nice rings and things like that, it's actually a great metal for doing catalysis, for being a catalyst. The problem is it's extremely expensive. If you ever compare gold jewelry with platinum, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. So platinum costs about $1,500 per ounce. So people know it's a great catalyst, but they really don't want to use much of it, and they want to make sure that they get as much bang for the buck out of, of the amount that they do use. Okay, so one of the students in my research group, Shi Rong Zhang, who I think I also saw earlier, has been using a technique which is called atomic layer deposition, which is a way of adding the platinum catalyst to these thin fuel cells. So in this technique, what we do is we place the fuel cell in a reactor, and we bring the platinum in in the vapor phase. Okay, so that platinum will react on the surface of the fuel cell. It leaves a microscopic amount of platinum behind. But that platinum is tangled up with other atoms. And so what we need to then do is come in with another vapor, which is oxygen, to react away those other atoms and free up the platinum. So there's actually a cycle here. We flow the platinum and then we flow the oxygen. And every time we do this, we add just a very, very small amount of platinum. So by choosing the number of platinum and oxygen cycles, we can select precisely what thickness we want of, of the platinum. And this is the technique called atomic layer deposition because we can deposit the platinum one atomic layer at a time. So it turns out that the catalysts and fuel cells work better if they're not smooth films, but rather they're rough and they have a lot of different edges and surfaces. So Shi Rong has figured out how to deposit on the fuel cell not a nice smooth film, but a grid of platinum like a window screen. So now picture that what you want <coughs> is for the mustard not to be smoothly spread on, but in a crisscross pattern. Okay, so how might you do this? So one thing you might do is you might dig through an arts and crafts kit, maybe your kids or your grandkids' kit, and you might find a rubber stamp with a crisscross pattern on it. And you could dip that rubber stamp in some mustard, and you could stamp it onto the bread, and you would have then transferred a crisscross pattern of mustard to the bread. There's another way you can do that, which is you could take the stamp and you could dip it in some butter. You could put that on the bread, and then when you spread on the mustard, it might just slide right off the buttered parts and only stick to the non-buttered parts of the bread. And that would also make a pattern of mustard. It would be the inverse, the negative pattern. So Shi Rong actually did something very, very similar to that on the atomic scale. Okay, so instead of, she, she came up with a rubber stamp. She actually fabricated it using the same <coughs> kinds of tools that are used to make microelectronics devices. And it had a grid pattern on it. That was very, very small, just a few microns instead of large. So instead of dipping it in butter, we don't really use butter very often in the laboratory, she dipped it in a very special type of molecule, which sticks very well to the surface of the fuel cell, and it sticks so well that platinum doesn't deposit there. So after she took this pattern of these molecules and put it down on the fuel cell, then she put that into the atomic layer deposition reactor, and platinum deposited everywhere but the grid. So what she got was a negative of this stamp pattern. So Shi Rong was able to do this very successfully, and she was able to make this grid pattern of platinum that was microscopically thin. So a couple of microns across and just a few nanometers thick. But even this very, very tiny amount of platinum gave a very noticeable improvement in the performance of the fuel cell. So she could get 10 times more power out of the solid oxide fuel cell with the platinum grid on it compared to not having that. So I hope I gave you a little, very small overview of a, of a couple of the different activities going on here and some of the background of why, why these are so important. And I just want to spend my last uh, few moments giving some perspective to the issue of sustainable energy. So there are some people that think you know, we may be too late, that significant global climate change has already been put into motion and no matter what we do, we're, we're not going to be able to prevent it. But I am one of the people that has great faith in the ingenuity and creativity and passion of people worldwide, um, particularly young folks. So over the past few years, I've seen a large swing in the interests of our incoming students here at Stanford toward issues of sustainable energy. Um, when I ask students now, I routinely ask the students, you know, why did you major in chemical engineering? What are you interested in doing? They very often state that they, they really want to work on energy problems. They really want to make a difference. So this was not the case even just a few years ago. Not that they weren't passionate a few years ago, but they were passionate about different things. So there's a growing recognition at all ages of the need for alternative energy solutions. And I think it's a great opportunity for young would-be scientists and engineers to have a large impact. 
So I uh, want to just end by encouraging all of you, actually, of any age, to get involved in whatever aspect of the solution you can so that we can all be part of the solution of sustainable energy. And thank you for your attention. So uh, we now have time for some questions. If you have a question, raise your hand, and I'll be happy to bring the mic by. Hi. Hello. Thank, thank you very much for the talk. Um, my question is, uh, early on you had mentioned that the atom has a particular energy band that has to be, you, you equated it to the river. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, you said that with not enough energy, the electron can't jump over, and too much, then you, too much energy is wasted. But I, my question is, is that energy band fixed, or might it be possible to shrink that band so that it takes less work for the electron to get over? Well, yeah, I mean, you can either change the kind of material or do things to a particular material to, to change the size of that band gap. But when it becomes too small, again, it, you go back to the first problem, which is then energy uh, is wasted because a lot of the sunlight's going to have more energy than that smaller gap, and it's going to produce charge carriers that uh, are only using part of that solar energy. Okay, so. thanks. You spoke about the fuel cells, and it seems to me a few years ago they were talking about that as a very promising uh, approach uh, for the, our cars, and it doesn't seem that we hear much about it anymore. Can you comment on that? Uh, I think they're still being pursued quite aggressively for automotive applications. Um, so there, I had been hearing that they're going to start introducing fuel cell cars. There are some prototypes already that are, are being leased. So I, I think there are just these challenges that have been uh, in the way of really commercializing them. So there, I talked about one type of fuel cell, the solid oxide fuel cell, which has this massively high temperature that nobody wants, you know, tooling around on a car with them. There's a more common type, which I think is the kind that's in the fuel cell here, which is a a proton exchange membrane. It's made out of a polymer. And the downside to that is you have to keep it just humidified just properly, and they're not that stable. And if they dry out, they don't work. So they're very finicky. Um, so there's been a lot of effort here at Stanford and lots of other places on that. And I, I am confident, actually, that you will see fuel cells powering a lot more things, cars and, and other applications, um, in, within a few years. I was getting the impression of a distributed system in which the um, photovoltaic generation was occurring in lots of places locally while the sun is shining. You're using it to generate hydrogen and oxygen for later when the sun goes out. But does that require a very large volume for the hydrogen? Or do you have to compress it? Or how much hydrogen are we talking about? Uh, this is, a, as Tom actually mentioned in, in the introduction, a, a very uh, big area of research because exactly what you point out is a concern. Um, you need to have a lot of hydrogen and you need to, you know, the simplest way, the way we already know how to do, you can find tanks of it um, in lots of laboratories, is to compress it. So compress it to very high pressure in a, in a, to get it into a smaller volume. People don't really like the idea of driving around with in cars with a big tank of compressed hydrogen on it. They're worried about, I mean, it's, it is a combustible uh, gas. So there is a lot of research on alternative ways of storing the hydrogen in different chemical forms or uh, different um, materials where it can go into the nooks and crannies and not just be there as a free gas. So that's a very, very active area of research. It is one of the current difficulties with fuel cells run from hydrogen, the whole storage, how you make the hydrogen, how you distribute it. And so hydrogen is just one type of fuel being used in fuel cells. Another one that's it's pretty common is methanol. Okay, we're all more comfortable working. Methanol is, is a type of alcohol, it's a liquid. Um, and it's, it's a lot easier to store. But hydrogen has a lot of potential because it has no carbon dioxide, um, but there are issues with making it and storing it. Thanks a lot. You explained things very well. Can you say a little bit about the status of the, uh, the solar industry and technology? 
you know, it started here in the United States, and then Japan was the leader, and right now the Germany is kind of the leader. It seems like there's a lot of things happening here in Silicon Valley. Can you say, you know, what's the what's the prognosis? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I hope if I was that good at it, I could become very rich in a short time by investing wisely. But um, I, I think that the reason Germany has been uh, taking so much uh, solar installation, so actually one of the explanations for the shortage of silicon is that there's so many solar panels being installed in Germany, is because the German government subsidized significantly the solar energy. Okay, so it's really... Uh, still expensive. They're still way more expensive than coal, but they've put a lot of money into, into that. I think that there are all kinds of new solutions being looked at here in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. So these second generation solar cells and also, as I mentioned, third generation solar cells. So I think the prognosis is excellent. So what I was trying to impart um, when I was talking about sort of the youth and the younger people coming through is I think if you could take just a small fraction of the ingenuity and resources that were put into the whole microelectronics industry and focus it on renewable energy, and I think there's some movement in that direction, I'm, I'm confident these problems can be solved. May not ever be quite as cheap as coal, but there are other solutions, more political, um, that could even things out. So I, I think we're definitely on a path. There's a lot more effort being put into development that has been put in in the past in, in solar energy, and that's what it's going to take. I don't really have a question for you, but I would like to make a comment. Since we are at Stanford, if there is any uh, error made in this statement, I feel it's my obligation to at least point out for the benefit of all the audience. And Tom did a good job to introduce you, but in his excitement to introduce you, he ad admitted that he made one error. But then uh, he made a second error, and that is for the benefit of all of you when he said that Andy Grove got his PhD from Stanford. In fact, I have nothing against the school across the bay over there, but, but he actually got his PhD uh, from UC Berkeley under Professor Andrew Akravos and in chemical engineering. And I could say quite a bit more because he was a colleague of mine. <laughs> It's all been a big sham, huh? <laughs> Hello. Um, you've talked about making hydrogen gas by electrolysis with electricity you got from the solar cells. <laughs> what about making hydrogen directly from sunlight on water and catalysts? Um, is, how much progress has been made on that line? Um, that is really, I would say, the holy grail of hydrogen production. So you, you have some photoelectrocatalyst, as it's called, which will directly take sunlight and you have it in water and it'll split it into the oxygen and hydrogen. And in principle, you can get more efficient conversion that way. Um, my colleague, Tom Jaramillo, actually has an active research program uh, looking at that. I, I would say it's uh, not as far along as some of the other technologies. Um, I think we need to get to a point where we can do that uh, because one of the things that sort of hasn't been mentioned is how are you getting this hydrogen? Yeah, it's a clean fuel, but if you had to use a lot of fossil fuels to make the hydrogen in the first place, it's again not necessarily carbon negative. And I think the only way to really do that in uh, a viable way is to take sunlight and use it to split the water, whether it's through a combined thing like I had with the demonstration where it goes through a solar cell and then splits it with an electrolysis cell or one combined device. Somehow that has to be the solution to produce hydrogen if we really want to have hydrogen as one of our mainstay fuels. Um, I have a question. Uh, I've heard a lot about printable solar cells. Sorry, I'll stand up. Uh, printable solar cells, and I was just wondering what the goals of that are and how feasible it is. Uh, well, there are definitely some companies in the area that are starting up on that uh, principle, and there's, there's research here at Stanford also on that. I mean, the goal is cheap, making them cheaply. So there are lots of processes that have already been developed for doing printing um, and just trying to harness that to, to make solar cells very inexpensively. So these are typically these second-generation thin-film solar cells. Hi. 
Uh, how close are you to commercializing some of these technologies, particularly the CZTS, and kind of what needs to happen to make this more widely available? Well, uh, it's it takes time to do, you know, we're, we're really sort of at the more basic research level. Um, we would like to be able to, in a short time, have a solution and be able to commercialize it. Um, so that's certainly our goal. Uh, I don't really have a good estimate for how long that might take. It could be, you know, 10 years, it could be 10 months. Uh, I think what really, one of the things that needs to happen is there just needs to be more resources put into that. So government funding, um, funding from industry, different sources, because it, it just, there are people really interested in working on it. Students would love to work on these problems. There's no shortage of very talented people, but it, it still takes time and money to make these things happen. So I, I think that's, uh, that's what we're sort of waiting for and, and getting to that next stage. In terms of getting to a completely carbon-free fuel cycle, you didn't mention using nuclear energy to produce the electricity that you need to produce hydrogen. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's currently uh, an important part of the energy portfolio and probably will remain so, but there, there's, you know, people are concerned and have been for a long time about nuclear energy. It's not really renewable in the sense of wind or solar because there's always a waste that's generated um, in the nuclear power plant. So it's not truly in the same category. I, I just am not an expert on nuclear energy. And in fact, that's not really an area of research um, in any big sense here at Stanford. So it, it, it's, it's certainly already a significant part of the energy portfolio. Hi. Um, we talked earlier about solar thermal. Now, how, how efficient is solar thermal compared to, you know, incident radiation compared to the photovoltaic? Because you like Kramer Junction and the other sites that are, have been in business for a long time. Yeah, I think, um, again, I, I mean, I'm not really an expert on that, but I think that some of the efficiencies that they're, they're claiming are similar to solar, photovoltaic. So going directly from sun into electricity and going via some thermal process to electricity, those can be similar. Um, and there are lots of interesting ideas with solar thermal, too. They usually involve, um, you know, move fluids, you heat an oil, and so they, they're a little more messy and actually more akin to some of the more conventional processing in some senses. Uh, you might actually use, heat the oil to uh, make steam, which runs a turbine, and so, so they have some of the same problems as other approaches. But I think the efficiencies uh, that companies that are working with that are hoping for and getting are, are similar. Um, are you familiar with any new work being done on flow cells? Flow cells? Yeah, it's more of a, it's similar to a fuel cell, but it's more of a closed loop. No. I'd be happy to hear about it. <laughs> we have one more here in the front here. Hi, I have a relatively uh, elementary question about uh, electrolysis of water into hydrogen and oxygen. You get out less energy than you put in. Uh, what's the proportion there? How much energy is lost? And then your description of how the, the uh, fuel cell worked, you know, breaking the oxygen apart, charging it, and then having it go through the membrane. Um, obviously, you're gaining back the energy that was that was put into the hydrogen and oxygen when they were separated, but I don't see the mechanism there for how that energy is captured. Is that, is that used in the breaking of the oxygen? Or, or what, what's, can I give them a little more detail on how that works? In the fuel cell part of it or the yeah. electrolysis part? Both, oh, two okay. questions. Well, I mean, I guess the, the one thing to point out on that is every step that you take loses some energy. So nothing is perfectly efficient. So there are losses with each of these processes. So the light comes in and it splits. You've lost energy there. And then when you put it back together, you've lost again. Um, the way you get electrical energy out of a fuel cell is by it, there, there's electron transfers going on during these chemical reactions. So it's one thing, you know, we say H2 plus O2 forms water. And I apologize, the stoichiometry is not correct on that. But uh, 
you are doing this in a way where you're, you're actually exchanging electrons. It's actually an electrochemical reaction. And you, by separating the two reactions that involve electrons, you can use the electrons as they're moving around and use them as electricity. So I was trying to describe that when the oxygen, the, let's say one step of it, the oxygen breaks apart, becomes charged, and as it moves across the fuel cell, that's part of the loop. And it reacts with the hydrogen on the other side, releases uh, an electron in that reaction, and that has to go back around to conserve the charge, and it does that through the external part of your fuel cell, and you just take that energy as it's moving by in, in the form of electrical energy. We have a thin film system uh, that we're considering right now. You mentioned that they uh, captured energy better than the photovoltaic cells, yet every thin film system I've ever seen has about half the efficiency. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why is that? <clears throat> well, there are all kinds of problems still to be worked out. So, I mean, silicon, most of these silicon crystal cells have extremely high purity, so very few traps, and so you could pull out a lot of uh, the energy, so that's why you have these high efficiencies. The thin films are usually uh, materials that have many more defects in them, so lots more traps, and so the efficiency of those cells is, is as you point out, not as high as the solar cells. They have the advantage currently that you can make them more cheaply, but there's a trade-off. They're, they're cheaper, but because they're cheaper, the material's not as good. If you put the same effort into making those, say, one single continuous crystal, like silicon, it would then cost a lot. Okay, so, uh, however, people who are making these second generation solar cells believe that they can get to similar efficiencies. They're working toward that. I don't know, you know if and when they will get to that, but they're certainly hoping that there are optimizations that need to be carried out in, in all different, I mean, we've sort of just been talking about the semiconductor, but there are lots of different parts to this device. Um, that could be optimized to get efficiencies as close to silicon as possible or higher. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.